Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Meckholm, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about biological controls in like a controlled environment setting, say a high tunnel with Dr. Casey Athey. But before we get to Casey, we must introduce our co-host with us every single week. We're joined by local foods educator Katie Parker in Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are things in Macomb? Still darn like slow fire up to spring, you know, it's cold, cloudy, rainy. Um, no, I'm not complaining at all, though. You know? <laughs> Doesn't right. sound like I'm complaining, right? <laughs> now, how about yourself? Things are going pretty well. How did your lettuce survive last week? They're dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, they uh, did not they were not hardened off enough to the point where they could survive a night out. And I totally, for people who didn't hear last night's episode and last night, yes, last week's episode. um, Yeah. I accidentally watered my flat of stuff, left it outside and the frost that night toasted them. So they're all gone. So starting over. Yes. Yes. Well, someone who I know was not leaving his flats of lettuce lay a, a muck outside so they can get, Roasted in the frost, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello. I just direct seed my lettuce, so that's why it doesn't happen. No, no problems there. We we just visited a farmer last night, actually our producer, Wendy, uh, and and I, and she direct seeded her spinach outside, and then she also had transplants indoors, and the stuff outside just looked by far much better than the indoor stuff, so there's something to be said for that cool season thing starting off in the ground there. So I did transplant all my broccoli and cabbage this weekend, planted some peas, so it's begun. It has begun. Have have either of you started the warm season stuff yet inside? Yeah. Katie, did you get Tomatoes. the high tunnel going? Uh, I haven't put anything in the high tunnel, but I've started some tomatoes and peppers to transplant into the high tunnel. I did tomatoes and peppers a couple weekends ago. Cotton's about six inches tall now. So, what are your unique uh, crops for this year, Ken? Doing artichokes. So, we started that about a month ago. So, those are coming up. Um, different type of cotton. We've got a couple different kind of types of rice we're going to do. So, it'll be fine. Oh, go ahead, Katie. I was just going to say, we have a a farmer doing large-scale rice production across the river in Missouri this year. So it's dry land type rice? I think so. Neat. Yeah, I'm excited to go see it. Well, uh, that would be interesting to see. I've been learning and hearing more about dry farming rice um, in different parts of the U.S., more of the southern parts, but Missouri, that would be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. I know their main pest are birds, I believe. Um, that's what they deal with a lot. I didn't have any issues last year, but I only had <clears throat> probably 20, 30 plants. So not worth anybody going after it. You get a little, little tiny cup of rice. Yeah. Um, I, I'm also doing artichokes this, this year, Ken. And I was shocked about when they emerged from the cell as from the seed, they're massive. They're, they're big plants. Yeah. I need to pop mine up. They're getting too big. Yeah. And it actually just needs to warm up so I can put them outside. But mm-hmm. do you guys exactly. like to eat artichokes? Uh, I, I do them once. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like them, but I like them pickled. And, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Grow them to share. <laughs> <laughs> I'm growing them so I can say I grew them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to be a tricky thing. I don't know how to grow artichokes in a cold climate because don't they need to get exposure to cold for uh, flower? Is there a biennial, I thought. And I think I'm too late, at least with mine. I did not start mine early enough to get them exposed to cold. I'm sure I, I picked one that's supposed to be good for short. It's a shorter season one that was, according to the seed catalog, good for zones that aren't, it wouldn't be warm mm-hmm. enough to. You're long enough, so we'll see. Maybe a failure, but no, I, I, I didn't even I look that far ahead. Trial yeah, error. that's right. That's how we learn how to do things in the garden. So, mm-hmm. um, well, 
speaking of which, uh, Katie, I know uh, you're go you have a high tunnel in Quincy. Ken, you are about to have something akin to a high tunnel, a caterpillar tunnel. Um, I've grown in a high tunnel in the past, and I think we've all worked with other growers that have done this. And I think one of the big things that we've seen is how sometimes pests can accumulate in some of these controlled structures. So uh, today, uh, we'd like to introduce our special guest for this week, uh, and that is Dr. Casey Athey. Now, Casey, she's an assistant professor and also extension specialist in entomology for specialty crops. Uh, and uh, Casey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, we are happy that you are here um, to help us talk about some of these issues with pests that can build up sometimes in these controlled structures. And namely, we're going to be talking high tunnels today, but um, no, I just, we've, we've had you on before about spiders. And so uh, how has the winter treated you? Pretty good. We're just trying to kind of gear up for the field season and get everything going, um, uh, get the stuff in the ground and get the high tunnel research going. And this will be the first year that we're going to be working on our large scale high tunnel project that actually involves um, commercial growers in the state as well. So we're going to start our monitoring program within those this year um, as well. So we're kind of getting getting ready for that too. Well, that sounds exciting. Well, Ken, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off then and getting us into this topic, please. All right. So before we get too far into the weeds here, um, can you kind of talk about where your research is taking place? Kind of what is a, a high tunnel and, and why are you looking at um, these systems? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, high tunnels are kind of a hybrid between a greenhouse system and open field production. And a lot of the reasons why people use high tunnels is to extend the growing season. Um, and we're looking at it because we know a lot about the production systems within greenhouses. And as far as like how you control pests and that sort of thing. And, and it's a very different thing in open fields, but there's you know, research within that as well. And a lot of recommendations for growers on what they can spray and how effective those things are in open fields, of course. But high tunnels, eh, not as much. Um, and so there's a fair amount of question when it comes to like spray programs as to whether they are appropriate for high tunnels versus open fields versus greenhouses. And then in addition, we don't really know how biocontrol works or doesn't work in high tunnel systems. Um, so for us, we know biocontrol bio works pretty good in greenhouses. We don't use it as much in open fields, um, but there's sort of this question in the middle about what's happening in these, you know, protected culture, but not as climate controlled as something like a greenhouse would be. So uh, a lot of your research is around using biological controls to manage pests in high tunnels. What are bi biocontrols or biological controls? Yeah, so biocontrol, generally speaking, is releasing or using um, a natural enemy. So something like a predatory insect or a um, parasitoid wasp, which are these little wasps that lay their eggs inside other things. Um, like caterpillars and that sort of thing, and then cause them to die, or pathogens. You can also use pathogens or nematodes, but it's basically using any of those things to control pests in a system. Um, I generally use predatory insects and predatory mites um, as my biocontrols, but it's really, biocontrol <clears throat> is a pretty large kind of blanket topic, and it also encompasses changing around the environment to try to bring in more things like spiders and lady beetles that are already in the environment, bring more of those into your crop. That's also biological control. So it's really just using um, insects, pathogens, that sort of thing to control other insects, generally speaking. So do we have to like go out and catch these insects or can you buy them from somewhere? Yeah, so you can buy them. Uh, from lots and lots of places. Uh, so if you're doing the sort of biocontrol that I always liken to like an insecticide spray, where you go, you go online, you buy the bugs, the company sends them to you and you release them um, in your tunnels or greenhouses. Um, those are commercially available. Lots of companies do it. There's a wide variety of things you can buy. Um, but then again, you can do things like 
plant a flower strip and then hopefully bring in the predatory bugs and spiders and things that are already out there and get them closer to your crops that you want, you know, some level of control to be happening, happening in. But no, generally speaking, you're not going out and catching them yourself and then releasing them into any place, unless you want to. <laughs> you're not gonna go grab a snake and bring it in to control the voles that are destroying everything in your high tunnel? <clears throat> probably not because it'd be hard to get the snake to stay. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, that's the other problem. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that actually leads into kind of the big question about high tunnel biocontrol. So if you think about if I buy a bunch of bugs and I go release them in a greenhouse, well, they can't get out. So presumably they're going to do what I want them to do because they can't escape. In a high tunnel, they, if they have wings, they could just leave. <laughs> like, And so that's kind of Honestly, one of the big questions of biocontrol in high tunnels is if we put them in, do they stay or mm -hmm. do they go? <clears throat> how, how long would they stay? I've seen growers who have actually started because of the pest problems, not because of anything they're releasing in their high tunnel. They've actually started putting insect netting up on their sidewalls to try to keep the stuff out. Yes. <clears throat> not trying to keep things in actually. So um I want, oh my gosh, this is so curious. So would, is that something that could then be used to keep things in potentially? Yeah, yeah, you know, it could. I think one of the things about putting the mesh around a high tunnel is that often the reason that we leave the high tunnels open is because it gets so hot in there. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the pests we're trying to keep out generally are small. And so you need a really small gauge mesh. And that would keep natural enemies in as well. It would do that. But the problem is you're going to run into the issue of now it's way too hot in here. Mm -hmm. And so there has been some work done with that, um, but it is definitely a double-edged sword um, because without any kind of climate control within the tunnel, all of a sudden it's like, well, we need to, you know, because if you get the mesh that's too small, it's not going to let the air flow through. And if it's too big, it's going to let the pests in. Yeah. Because um, I, I think a lot of what we're talking about, they are teeny tiny. Um, what, like what pests are, would, were you looking at specifically? Yeah, so this is the other thing that is interesting about high tunnels versus things like greenhouses or open fields. So greenhouses are characterized by a suite of pests that are basically the same every time. So you have things like aphids, white flies, thrips, which are really tiny, and spider mites. Um, and if you grow things in greenhouses, generally speaking, you're going to have at least one of these things as a problem. And the same goes for high tunnels. These pests are definitely a problem in high tunnels. They can be in open fields. They're not quite as bad in open fields as a blanket statement as they are in protected culture. But high tunnels have the distinction of also containing the open field pests. So a moth can fly into a high tunnel and likely she's not going to fly back out. So she's going to lay her eggs on the plants in there as well. Whereas you do not have caterpillar pests in greenhouses. Not really. Um, things like stink bugs would be a problem in high tunnels as well. And as an example from this summer, we had striped army worm issues here in Urbana. And we had some on our open field tomatoes. Like it wasn't nothing, but it wasn't there wasn't that many. And we had so many in the high tunnels, just such an absurd number of them in the high tunnels because the moths would fly in and they'd be stuck and they don't really know how to get out. So they just be like, oh, hey, I'll lay my eggs on all these tomatoes in here. And so the numbers were just, it was a lot. Um, and that is not something you would get in a greenhouse. So when we're doing biocontrol, we are generally targeting those little greenhouse pests, so things like thrips and aphids and that sort of thing. But we do also have to contend with caterpillars. I, I know in our smaller high tunnel that I used to grow in, it, was, it wasn't that big. I would definitely in, walk in and I would see all of the moths and everybody flitting at the top of the plastic, which you don't always see, I think, in the larger high tunnels. I think they're there. They're so big. They get a little mm -hmm. bit lost in there, but the smaller one, I definitely, I could, I would walk in and I would hear the sound of beating wings on the plastic. So 
So they're mm-hmm. definitely getting in there. Yep. And, and insects. So one of the ways we trap insects as a, as a general statement is when insects get in a thing, they try to fly upward. They're going to try to fly up towards the sun. So there are different, well, you know, that direction anyway, there are different trapping things that take advantage of this. And a high tunnel is basically a giant insect trap because they get in and then they fly up and they don't have any place to go. And so they're not going to fly back down generally and get out. Um, And so that can create, yeah, a big problem for caterpillar pests. So Casey, after getting a, a year under your belt with this research project in biocontrols in high tunnels, What'd you find out? And I'm curious if anything at all surprised you in the results. So we found basically a a fair amount of things that didn't really work for the way we were releasing them. But what we did find is overall, we did have a reduction in some of the pest groups when we were releasing the uh, predators generally, like as a group. So we had, we didn't, every pest was not reduced that we were um, trapping for, but we did have a reduction in aphid pests overall in the tunnels that we were releasing and we had a reduction in white flies. So it seemed like the things that we were releasing were probably having a pretty, um, pretty good effect on those groups. Uh, The thing that we found that was disappointing, although now the more I've looked at things, the less surprised I am by this, is that uh, thrips were actually, there was more of them in the tunnels we released predators in. Thrips are a problem. Um, They definitely seem to be one of the bigger problems for the high tunnel growers. Um, And so it was kind of surprising that we found more in the release tunnels compared Mm -hmm. to the control tunnels. But one of our goals for next season is to focus on those. So to really release things that will go after thrips above all else. What we did in this first year, our idea was to say, okay, well, we don't really know what our pest pressure will look like as far as what of these sort of traditional greenhouse pests we're really going to be contending with. So when we designed the program, we picked what are called generalist predators. So we picked things that are listed to attack a series of things. Um, In fact, I believe two of the ones, well, one of our predators actually would go after all four of the groups we were monitoring. Um, And then the other two went after a combination of of the groups we were monitoring for. And so we were like, well, maybe we'll just release these generalists and they'll they'll do their job. Um, And, they seem to have done well for a couple of the groups. So they became, one might argue, more specialized than we thought that they would. Um, But they did not do anything for the thrips. Um, And so we are looking to really target uh, those uh, next year. And I've had growers that have asked me about thrips and high tunnels. So I know that it's a problem throughout Illinois. And it's one of the groups that I think at least from talking to growers, they are more concerned about than maybe the, the other three that we were finding. And then we did have a uh, predator that is a specialist on spider mites. Um, and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. We had a pretty big spider mite infestation and some strawberries in a tunnel that wasn't actually part of our experiment. And we released those predatory mites once and they cleaned up the problem. Um, I mean, the strawberries were to the point where I didn't know that we were still going to get strawberries off of them. Like they were really infested with spider mites and we released the uh, predatory mites onto those and Then a couple of weeks later, the strawberries looked beautiful. We never did any other control other than just that. Um, And that was surprising. I didn't think that we'd be able to rescue those plants once the spider mites got out of control. And we really, we really did um, without any other insecticides or anything. I saw the videos from Dixon Springs where you're standing by the difference, the strawberries, the before and after where the thrips damage was. And that was really striking. Um, The strawberry plant looks like it put out, was it, it might've been two different ones, but one had been severely affected by thrips and the other one, it was either the same plant that had recovered or as a plant that had been treated 
and and, and those were spider different. mites those were those spider, spider mites, mites. Okay. they were and and yeah so what happened is you know we most of those those towers they were in in um, towers and most of them were infested mm -hmm. and you could see the webbing and i mean you could just look at it and see the number of spider mites on those and what we had been using is we had been using a different predatory mite that is a generalist it will attack uh thrips, white flies, and spider mites. And it did not do anything for the spider mites and the strawberries. So once we released, you know, the specialist, the thing that is supposed to take care of spider mites, it did take care of the spider mites. Um, it really worked well. Uh, and there are different philosophies for how you, you know, do biocontrol as far as that goes. But if you know that you have a very specific problem, the answer is likely to be use a specialist that goes after that thing um, generally. And, and since now we have a better idea of what our system looks like and what we're going after uh, this year, I think we'll be able to target things a lot better than we did last year. So will like beneficial insects, is there the potential that they will attack each other? Yes, <laughs> yes, there is. So one of the problem with predatory insects, spiders, predatory mites, is that they, unless they are ex an extreme specialist, they do not discriminate. If they encounter something they can eat, they will eat it. Um, <clears throat> and this is especially true for spiders, but it is true for all predatory insects. Um, there's a specific term for it. A lot of people study it. We know it can be a problem. Um, and so one of the things that you try to do is if you have different groups of predatory insects that you're using for different pest problems in your high tongue, you want to be pretty targeted with where you're putting those. Um, because if you can put them where the pests are specifically, they may kind of stay there and, and eat. And if you have ones that, you know, you might traditionally think could go after each other, kind of want to keep them separate or release them separately. You know, we released all of our groups at the same time, but I did try to vary where we put them so that I wasn't sticking things next to each other to be like, oh, I, there's a meal. I can eat that. Um, <clears throat> and then if you have a large resident predator population, there's no reason to think that some of your resident predators aren't also eating some of your biocontrol agents and vice versa, because um, that's definitely happening too. Is a resident predator one that is there without you releasing it it just comes in on its own yes it is yep yep i i like to think just something that's living in your high tunnel you didn't do anything to get it there but it lives there um and you have things like you know spiders ants um lady beetles uh lace wings um little predatory bugs uh that kind of stuff that you're just gonna have um, as long as you have not, you know, sort of nuked your high tunnel with lots of broad spectrum insecticides, you should have all of those things. Um, yeah, you might not be in that high tunnel either. Yeah. If you're, yeah, exactly. Like exactly. That, gonna... Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so other than the mites, what were the things you were releasing? Yeah. So we had predatory mites. We had, um, something called the minute pirate bug. Um, which is a really common biocontrol agent. It's also a really common bug you just are going to find in tunnels. Um, and then we released a um, lady beetle, uh, the twice stabbed lady beetle. Adelia is its mm -hmm. genus. Um, out of the ones we released, the only one that I am not trying again at all is the lady beetle. So lady beetles are great. You'll find lots of them, of them in your tunnels. They're fantastic. Always happy to see them. When it comes to purchasing them commercially, they are pretty expensive. They can be very fussy. And unlike the other things we buy, where they can come in things like these little sachets that are just these little bag looking things you could just put in your plant, or they're sort of in this... Um, medium that kind of looks like sawdust and you can kind of sprinkle them. The lady beetles had to be individually placed on plants. <clears throat> um, and it was a lot. And we never recovered any of them. We never found them again. So like, it's not to say they weren't in there, maybe, but 
it, it was a lot of work for probably not a lot of payoff. Um, and I think generally speaking, Lady Beetles, when you release them, tend to be pretty, pretty fussy. And it's probably a group that I would recommend, at least at this point, the growers kind of stay away from. <clears throat> and in the before time, when I worked at Disney World, um, we would release we would give tours to the greenhouses and we'd let people release ladybugs and you never found them. Yeah. <laughs> and well, we just keep, and we'd keep them in the refrigerator and then mm -hmm. let them go and that was the end of them. Yeah, well, and lady beetles will escape too. They'll escape greenhouses. I don't know how. I mean, I do. They're, they're people, things have the ability to escape stuff you wouldn't expect, but they, they will do that too. Like they just, they don't like to be contained. And that being said, you'll find them in your high tunnels all the time, but there's just something about the sort of rearing and releasing that I just, I don't think they're particularly effective. <clears throat> Do you, so is there like a, um, a tool a grower could look at, it's like, or a gardener, if this pest, then this beneficial or predator way so, to go about it? Or is that what you're working on? Yeah, kind of, that's kind of what I'm working on. So different companies will have different things. The, the commercial biocontrol companies. Mm -hmm. So the one that I'm working with right now for this season has a lot more um, of that kind of information. And uh, they seem to be pretty hands-on when it comes to like recommending what they would, what you would do. They have this uh, thing. It's like these, these cards that actually show you like what pest you would be targeting and um, <clears throat> like, you know, the, the little, the little predator there, and then it's got information about it and it has a pest list and, you know, that sort of thing. And so there's some that are doing more of that, but those are coming from commercial companies as well. And so I think one of the things that will be useful out of this project is more of sort of an extension fact sheet that talks about, like, if you're finding this pest, we found that this thing is the best on it. Yeah. Um, and my grad student is going to be doing uh, lab experiments as well where she's going to be, you know, drilling down to some of those questions of like, will they eat each other? Um, what do we do if, you know, this pest is on here, which ones are most effective and that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and then we should be able to, to do better. We're hoping after all of this to be able to actually have research backed recommendations for growers. Cause right now we kind of don't as, as much as we would like anyway for high tunnel production. All right. So going back to nuking your high tunnels um, <laughs> with pesticides, yes. if, if you want to be using some of these beneficial insects, mm -hmm. predatory parasitoids, what have you, um, and you're still using pesticides, how, do, how would you integrate those um, with each other? Yeah, so I think that part of the problem and part of the reason that we are doing this project at all is that the four big groups that I talked about, the aphids, white flies, thrips, and spider mites, have this habit of um, getting worse after sprays by broad spectrum insecticides. And we think that's primarily due to the fact that often those groups aren't as effective affected by the broad spectrums, but their natural enemies certainly are. So even within a closed system, if you have aphids, you'll find parasitoids in there. They just, they get in, they even get into like greenhouses. They're very good at finding those aphids. And so there's a suite of things happening around these greenhouse pests that you disrupt a lot if you spray broad spectrums. So there are more sort of natural enemy friendly sprays. What we did this summer is because we were releasing biocontrol agents for the little things, we sprayed um, Dipel, which is a BT spray, to take care of the caterpillars. It does not affect any of the natural enemies. Um, it doesn't affect any of those other pests either, of course, but it does kill the caterpillars. And that for us was a very good complement to, to the biocontrol. And so I think the answer is to find things that would target if you're doing a biocontrol pro uh, program, try to stick with just using the biocontrol for the things that you are targeting. And then for other things that you're not targeting with that program, use something like Dipel that, you know, really is a more targeted spray for the other things you might be finding. Um, because one of the things about using biocontrol that is a contrast to insecticides is that it doesn't happen all at once. So 
People like to see immediate results. They like to think, well, I'm going to release these things into my tunnel and immediately I'm not going to see these pests anymore. And that's not true. It will take a hot second. But once they get established and once everybody else who's in the tunnel is helping, if you will, these things really do work, but they don't work 10 minutes after you, you know, release. Um, and so I think with an IPM strategy, you know, you stick with biocontrol as your sort of control mortality measure for the pests you're doing, and then you can spray for other things in addition. What about like larger scale or outside scale? Um, do, are we able to use biological controls outside of a high tunnel and like a field scale for control? So the answer to that is kind of not really yet. Um, so a lot of the larger scale biocontrol work has been done primarily in the sort of conservation biocontrol world. So the idea of doing something to your field to bring in natural enemies that are already in the environment. Um, and part of that is just probably sheer numbers and the fact that outside the, the predators can kind of go wherever they want. So there is some work right now in um, parasitoids for corn earworm, trying to get those in the field um, in, in sweet corn production. So that'd be a pretty large scale thing. But the timing has to be perfect. So there's a lot of work being done on that. And then the other thing that for large scale field production that's being looked at right now is um, using drones to release natural enemies over a field. Um, and so there's some work with uh, actually spider mite control. Um, and then I think some like fly control as well, a little bit with that. So that's probably, you know, if it, if that, as that research goes forward, it's probably the avenue that goes. Um, uh, but, you know, as far as successful biological control programs that a grower can use, those live in protected culture right now. So greenhouses for sure. Um, and then, you know, even within the high tunnels, I mean, I'm pretty optimistic that biocontrol, once we find a good mix, is, is a good answer for high tunnels as well. Yeah, so if we don't um, release insects, earlier you would mentioned kind of like planting a flower strip or something to attract insects. Is that something we could do for larger scale? So it, it can be. Um, one of the problems is that right now, the way the research looks is that you would have to do a lot of interplanting. So, you know, you, we really do get more natural enemies within, you know, a couple of rows from whatever the wildflower strip, cut flower strip, whatever it might be. We really do get more natural enemies in there. And often we get more control of things, but it's limited. They don't go very far. And so you, you know, there need to be more inner, inner planting for that. Um, the other thing about using those kind of techniques right now um, is that the research is looking at how to make that economically viable. So one of the things that we're hoping to do is to do some cut flower strip work in high tunnels because you obviously can't tell a grower, hey, so you should plant these like wildflowers or whatever in here and just they'll be pretty and they'll take up an entire row of your high tunnel and you definitely don't need to be producing food in there or anything that you're going to be selling. But if they could do some cut flowers and then sell those if they do a farmer's market in addition, then that's probably an economically viable way to bring in and hold natural enemies. And so that's actually on the docket as well for, for some future research um, that we're doing. Are there plants that we know that attract predatory in insects? Yeah, so a lot of times people use things like buckwheat um, uh, and, and stuff like that. So they have to have call them extra floral nectaries. So flowers will produce extra nectar that brings in things and other just um, uh, resources that natural enemies can use. But there are there are actually, you know, quite a few things that people use. And even the cut flower strips, honestly, like that you'll see, I mean, probably all seen that where it's just like, there's all kinds of stuff on it. And we had a tunnel down at Dixon Springs that did have a cut flower strip on the outside of it. And our aureus, either retention, because we released aureus, or the, the natural aureus populations coming in was way higher in that tunnel than it was any of the other ones. Um, 
and it was just flowers in it. Um, and so, you know, I think you wouldn't even have to be super specific with it. And I think it probably still works um, as far as, you know, a variety of the natural enemies we're seeking. So for, for home gardeners, I usually tell people, let your herbs go to flower. Oh, sure. You know, you're, if you have carrots and one of those happens to bolt, just leave it. Yeah. Because um, yeah. they have those small flowers that, especially the wasps and stuff can get into easily. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, and it's, it's always good to have things that are going to, you know, have some resources for natural enemies or pollinators or, you know, whatever the sort of beneficials, um, you know, you're looking for. But as far as the research into how effective, so of course, the first question is, will they bring in the natural enemies? Okay, cool. But then what's the next step? So is the next step that those ones that are brought in by the flower strip are actively eating the pests? Um, and if not, then what are they doing? And, you know, again, when you're, yeah, obviously looking at the economics of the system, it's like if a grower could just plant tomatoes instead, and even though he's got more, or he or she has got more of, you know, aureus in the tunnel, if they're not doing pest control, it's like, well, we need to be able to recommend something that sort of, you know, does both things, if we can. <laughs> Casey, I have to ask about a particular grouping or family of plants, cucurbits. Uh -huh. um, I've grown them in high tunnels, I've grown them outside, and I've always struggled with pests. And oftentimes I've had to turn to some types of uh, pesticide, typically a carbaryl based formulation. And um, I just wish I could figure out a way to grow these things. Are there biological controls for some of those common cucurbit pests? Kind of not really, like not oh, commercially no. available. Um, <laughs> so we found in Kentucky in a, a project that was being done in my lab when I was getting my PhD that um, as far as the sort of main pests and cucurbits, so if you took the, the, the cucumber beetles and squash bugs, um, generalist predators were doing better at eating squash bugs than they were at eating the other groups. But really the answer with cucurbits is to cover them. Um, if you're not going to spray, it's to cover them, uh, to cover them for as long as you can cover them, cover them until pollination. Um, and then, you know, scout, lots of scouting specific, you know, look for your squash vine borer. If you're growing them at home, you're going to have a squash vine borer problem. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're growing them, if you're a large commercial grower, squash vine borer is still out there, but it's not going to be that thing of like, oh, I have a zucchini plant. Oh, now it's dead today. Mm -hmm. What happened? Um, but as far as biological controls right now, there's not a lot for the cucurbit pests. Um, uh, and I don't know that there's been a whole lot of research outside of like gut content work. And when I did gut, gut content work, so when I collected predators and saw what they were eating in a cucurbit system, the answer was they weren't eating the cucurbit pests either. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. Ah. Now, I will say things like cucumber beetles because they spend so much of their time underground. I didn't do a lot of, you know, like soil studies to see what's under there. But yeah, the biocontrol on those, right now there's a fair amount of work in trap cropping, things like that, um, to try to sort of use a different tactic than just, again, you know, burning it to the ground, if you will, and spraying a whole lot. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I think, again, if you can cover it, you cover it. Uh, row covers are a great answer um, for, for cucurbits, generally speaking. Gotcha. I also had heard about squash, uh, yeah, squash vine borer BT injections. Is that something that is successful? Is that, and if so, is that before or after the borer gets into the vine? Yeah, so that would have to be after the borer gets into the vine. And let me just look up something real quick. I think I just read about that recently, actually. Um, so I think BT does okay on squash vine borer. Now, what you need to do if you've got squash vine borer and you're worried about that is traps. So there's a, there's a lure for squash vine borer. So you could do trapping and you can count the number of squash vine boards you get in your trap. And then you have an idea when they're flying of when they might be laying eggs. Because the nice thing is if you're a home grower, you can remove the squash vine boards 
from those plants if they're not too big. You can actually cut them out of the stem. You can also scrape the eggs off. There's a variety of things you can do if you're monitoring for them, which as a home grower would just require buying one trap and one lure and putting it in your garden. And then you could be looking for them and they're big and pretty and charismatic. So mm-hmm. like, oh, if yeah. you think you have it in the trap that's only supposed to be attracting uh, squash vine borer, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, it's an easier one for people to deal with for sure. Um, and um, if she wasn't killing my zucchini every summer, she's oh, a beautiful clear wing moth. Oh, so pretty. Just the mm-hmm. prettiest thing, because they're kind of also this like metallic navy blue color mm-hmm. with the orange. They're just a beautiful moth, but yeah, no, no, we can't have them. <laughs> um, they're probably one of the prettier pest insects, actually, to they're, be honest. They're lovely. Japanese uh, beetles are also kind of pretty, but then you hate them at the same yeah, time. So, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty great as far as prettiness, but oh boy. Um, those I know things, Ken loves them. Uh, those things. So, yeah. Throw in spotted lanternfly, emerald ash borer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they really are. Yeah, let me see. So um, it does seem like BT is is effective for squash vine borer. Um, uh, but as far as how you would do the injections, um, I'm not sure about that. BT sprays for organic growers are effective. So it all comes down to timing. So often anything, and this, again, I'm making a lot of blanket statements today, but as a blanket statement for things that bore into a thing, the timing of sprays is right after that thing hatches out of its egg. Because of course it does not immediately bore into the thing. It has to actually do that. So if you're trapping and you are an organic grower and you use BT sprays, when you hit that trap threshold or when you find them in the traps, you spray, then those things will hatch out of the eggs and then they will encounter that BT. Um, And that will be the time that is really, really useful. Um, Because I don't think most of the BT sprays, I don't know this for sure. Um, I don't know how well, because obviously the bug has to eat it. And so the injection probably would work just fine as well. Um, But I, you know, it's just hard to get at them without manual removal once they are in that vine. Yeah. Um, and, and again, manual removal works. Like truly, you think I can't cut into this vine, this is gonna kill the plant. Just be careful and you can do that. And I had a spaghetti squash plant in my yard last year that had, I think nine squash vine borer caterpillars in it. Wow. And it, I was not paying attention, obviously. And by the time we found them, uh, I was, I had my daughter out there with me and she's five and she was holding the little vials and we were pulling them out and she was putting them in and deciding how many we could put in each and, you know, helping me find them. Um, but I cut them out and my plants, even though they looked kind of sad and there was a lot of vine borers in that one plant, they did produce and continue to produce some spaghetti squash for much longer than I thought they were going to based on the infestation and how late I got those caterpillars out. Yeah, I, I hear people that might drag their feet when I, I mention you can take a razor blade and pull them out. And I'm like, you can either do that or just lose the plant. So right, you could let the plant yeah. die too. That's fine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. No, it's 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 weird because so many things. The answer truly is manual removal. Oh, mm-hmm. did you see a tobacco hornworm? Manual removal. Yes. <laughs> like just take it off the plant. <laughs> yep. Yep. Lots of soapy water buckets in my garden. That's all I know. So Mm -hmm. yeah, just throw them in there. Yep. Well, Dr. Casey Athey, this has been an absolute pleasure. I've learned so much about biocontrols. I can't wait to go out and start finding pests so then I can see what's eating them. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a mad world to be an insect, I know. But uh, (laughs) thank you so much for being on the show today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Always fun. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by Katie Parker this week. So thank you, Katie, for that. And of course, thank you, Katie and Ken, for being with us every single week as our loyal co-hosts. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Casey, for all the great information. I feel like you should join us again next week. (laughs) I think I will. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be great. (laughs) And Chris and Ken, it's always good to see you guys. Yes, thank you, Casey. And thank you, Chris and Katie, and 
I think we should do a, do this again next week, all of us. <laughs> oh, well, Ken, we shall do this again next week, all of us. We're going to have Dr. Casey Athey back to talk more about insects, but this time we're going to be throwing climate change into the mix. What does that mean for the insects and maybe us that also have to live and need some of these insects along with us? So uh, good growing listeners. Thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.